Welcome to the Folio Sightlines blog. I'm Greg Bygrass, President of Folio Institutional, and I'm glad to have with us today Dave DeVoe, Founder and Managing Director of DeVoe & Company. Today, Dave and I will talk about some of the issues that surround mergers, acquisitions, the succession planning, and valuation in the advisory firm space. Dave founded his company in 2011 to help wealth management companies optimize their business decisions. The company has supported hundreds of firms in valuation, consulting, and investment banking engagements since their, their launch. Dave is frequently quoted by Investment News, Financial Advisor IQ, RIA Biz, and many other important industry publications. David, welcome to the Folio Sightlines blog. Greg, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Thank you. Dave, let's start with the landscape of M&A activity across the RIA space. What are the trends you're seeing? Are any of these trends the result of changes in either fiduciary rule regulation or the anticipation of same, or perhaps the upheaval of uh, the broker protocol? Yeah, yeah. Right now, um, M&A is, is very active. As a matter of fact, uh, we've recently experienced our fourth successive record year of merger and acquisition activity. And, um, and when you look at the, the industry itself, there's a high degree of likelihood that this, this uh, merger and acquisition activity will, will increase for several years to come. Um, there's just natural structural changes to industries which drive consolidation and mergers and acquisitions. So, as you know, Greg, this is a hyper-fragmented industry with 10,000 firms, depending on how you define uh, these organizations, but 10,000 you know, SEC-registered REAs. And hyper-fragmented industries just naturally start to consolidate. So what we're what we're seeing is um, a number of different factors that are driving mergers and acquisitions. Uh, is there an impact on things like the fiduciary world rule? To an extent, you know, bro broker protocol. To an extent, there as well. But the the more profound um, drivers of mergers and acquisitions are related to succession planning and scale. So as you as you know, you, you go to conferences, you, you talk to a lot of advisors. We we have a, a a partnership pool, the owners of these organizations that are aging along with the rest of America. And as we see these folks moving toward uh, retirement age, they need to start thinking through succession plans. As a matter of fact, the, the first 14 years of the 16 years that I've been focused on REA merger and acquisition activity, uh, that was really the key driver for that M and A uh, volume. Over the last two years, we've seen a, a new driver, which is the power of scale. Advisors are now merging, selling, acquiring. They're using mergers and acquisitions as a tool to best achieve scale, enable them to have a stronger value proposition to their clients, a more comprehensive set of services and capabilities, to have uh, greater leverage in terms of their day-to-day -day activities, and be part of a, a stronger, more long-lasting firm. So those are some of the key drivers that I expect will will um, continue to push mergers and acquisitions for years to come. Also, that is there um, is there a stage of a firm's maturity that the uh, leadership of the firm should be thinking about valuation? Is this an issue that startup RIA should care about as well? Yeah, yeah, I think um, it, clearly we, we see a lot of volume. We've done several hundred valuations over the last couple of years. As a matter of fact, we are total nerds about it. <laughs> uh, but, but I, and I think that's part of it is, is a firm at any stage of the life cycle can benefit from really an industrial strength valuation. You know, there's some valuations out there for a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks. They tend to be 50 pages of boilerplate and there's probably not as much value add. But hiring a firm like ours that is going to, you know, run a discounted cash flow, we literally will tear our company apart and put it back together and again economically. Part of the power of that is understanding what the value of the firm is. And clearly if there's a succession plan that's being implemented, if someone's ready to sell their firm, they want to know what it's worth, that number can be critically important. Um, by contrast, the vast majority of firms that hire us to do evaluation um, at, at the end of the engagement, they say, you know, literally, wow, I, I got as much or even more out of this journey you took me on and greater insights into how to run my company better. Um, so if you have a disciplined valuation process like this, you know, uh, it's, it becomes almost a diagnostic of the firm. 
and firms, you know, at any stage of the life cycle can benefit from this. If you're near an event where you're going to be selling the term externally, doing this several years beforehand enables you to understand what levers to pull on, how to, to how to really, you know, optimize the business before you sell. You're sort of painting the house, you're putting in a new garden, you're doing a lot of these things that you can actually appreciate perhaps for a couple of years before you sell the house, um, as an analogy. But even if you're in an earlier stage of this life cycle, you're just starting to implement better best practices. You know, you're running the firm like a, a, a business, an industrial strength business. So I don't think it's ever too early to uh, to get an, uh, an REA evaluate, um, evaluated, even including a startup REA. This can be a, an extremely powerful time to do so. Dave, I happen to be a fan of old classic uh, westerns, and recently read an article of yours in the period of financial planning where you referred to the old uh, film The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly as a manifestation of the ways to value an advisory firm. Can you, uh, can you speak to that and tell us more, more about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Clint Eastwood. Um, so yeah, the good, the bad, and the ugly. I, I think um, we'll, we'll start at the, the back end with the ugly. Uh, you know, 16 years ago when I entered this business, I started going to conferences or talking to advisors, and I'd hear this two times revenue. You know, what's your firm worth? Two times the revenue. And I, I scratched my head. You know, I was, I was just a couple years out of business school, and I thought, wow, this is just a, a crazy way to value a firm. Are people really doing this in the industry? Um, and, you know, sometimes even now I, I speak at conferences and I'll say, hey, have you guys heard the new metric? It's now 2.3 times revenue is, is sort of this, this drumbeat that we hear. Um, you know, I guess we could call it ugly. We could definitely call it inaccurate. We can call it downright dangerous. This is a very blunt instrument to, to value a firm. Um, not only that, that rough metric of this number times that, right? You know, let's keep it really simple. Two times revenue. Anyone can do that math. Uh, but the revenue figure itself um, is really misleading. You can have two identical firms or two firms with, let's say, identical revenue, but one firm is much more efficient and effective. They put best practices. They've really created a streamlined process. They have, you know, right size the number of advisors per employee or client facing. They, they literally have created an organization that can run with two less employees and do it even better. Um, that firm is not worth the same as the company next door to them that hasn't done that work. It's it just be outrageous to consider those to be the same uh, valuation. So this this two times revenue is the ugly or, or dangerous way. You know, a multiple of cash flow is a little better. Cash flow pays back the investor on the investment. So you're getting closer to home. You know, um, cash flow is one of several key factors to value a firm. But it's still a very blunt instrument. Essentially, you're 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 saying, hey, let's use math that Dave DeVos, you know, 13 year old son can do in his head a couple years ago to value a firm that's worth millions or even tens of millions. It's it's the life work of, of someone who founded the firm. It's a junior partner who's quite literally spending their life savings to invest in this organization. But let's just use a multiple that some, you know, um, in a, some young kid can do in their head to value the firm. It, 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 again, it's it, it's bad. It's not as dangerous as a multiple of revenue, but it's irresponsible. Instead, you know, these are critically important decisions. As I said, retirement plans are weighing on this. Life work is playing. Um, life savings are at play. So to take the, the time, money, and expense, you know, our valuations run from, you know, uh, 11, 16, or $21,000 to spend this money to get a valuation that's truly accurate um, is really what I believe is the responsible thing to use, to do. So whether you're in your own company or there's other firms too that, that do discounted cash flow models, um, that's, that's really the best way to value a firm. That's helpful. Thank you. Let's um, switch to uh, the conversation a little bit to the succession planning uh, discussion. Are you seeing any trends uh, for RIAs there? And I guess as a follow-on, is there such a thing as a right time to begin considering and planning a succession? Yeah, yeah. I, I think on a, on a very macro level, the, the trend line is good. I, again, 16-plus years ago when I started, I'd ask folks their succession plan, and and this is usually after they wax on about, 
how, how much they love their clients and their clients love them and their clients depend on them for advice. After they wax on all that, I had to ask them about their succession plan. And they'd say, you know, I'm going to die with my boots on. I, I'm just going to, they're going to ca- carry me out of here in a cardboard box. And I thought, wow, that's, that's just not, that doesn't sound like really fiduciary. It doesn't sound like taking care of these clients that you love and depend on you. You know, I'm imagining my grandma while she was still alive, this cute little old lady, um, getting a, a letter in the mail saying, hey, your advisor died. You're on your own. Go find one. I mean, that would just be, you know, devastating to her. Where does she even start? So, um, fortunately, over the last 16 years, the, the, the needle has shifted, and I think advisors are, are, are planning further ahead. That said, the needle has not moved enough. You know, 15 years ago, 25% of advisors had a written succession plan in place it is now, most of them don't plan on dying with their boots on, but now only 30% have a written plan in place. The ne- needle's moved in the right direction, but it, it's still not where it needs to be. So I would encourage anyone, you know, shortly after they, they launch the company, granted, you, you got to get the, the boat to, to, to not sink, you need to push away from the shore, but, you know, in the very early stage of the life cycle to start thinking through that succession plan, Business targets taking care of clients and early stages that can be, you know, connecting with an advisor that shares your same investment philosophy or client service philosophy. You know, that that's a great candidate to to sign a buy and sell agreement so that if you get hit by a bus, your clients are at least in good hands. Um, but clearly, as the as the firm becomes more mature, starting to put that succession plan in place methodically identifying those internal candidates or even looking externally if you don't have those internal candidates, but identifying those people, starting to coach them, coach the skills that they require to run an organization like yours. This this can take a while to pass that baton. So this can be a great way to not only take care of your clients and ensure that, that uh, you know, there's a succession plan in place for you, uh, but it also will give your next generation, give your employees um, a greater sense, greater sense of, of commitment to the firm. They'll they'll stay along, they'll they'll stay around. Your retention rates will go higher, and they'll just be more fully engaged. So there's a lot of power to succession planning that is well beyond just having that succession plan in place. And are there um, any sort of what you might call critical succession planning building blocks? The firm orders, uh, the firm owners should be thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I think um, you know a, a few different categories that I consider. One is is starting with the equation. You know, is internal the right path, or sometimes internal doesn't exist. You don't have people in place, or um, they don't have the the interest or the skill set to run the company. So in that case, you're looking externally. In some cases, too, despite the best intentions to sell internally. Um, it's a good problem to have, but it becomes a problem. The firm becomes too valuable. It grows too quickly. You know, these firms are have been growing at a great clip in many cases, and once you even have a few hundred million in assets under management, it becomes a challenge um, and eventually impossible to sell internally. The, the mail truck has just gotten too far away from the dog. The dog's not going to be able to catch up. So um, one of those key decisions is, is thinking through whether internal or external makes the most sense. And even if internal is feasible, there's a number of firms in this industry that haven't thought through that math and unfortunately are going to be faced with the fact that their their next gen simply can't afford them. Um, the good news is most firms do want to sell internally. More good news is a lot of firms have those employees in place and they can't afford it. So once you have that 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 situation, then you want to start thinking through some of the building blocks. So you can oversimplify them and put them into two major categories. There's sort of the the equity side of the equation, the economics, the the migration. We can talk about that momentarily. And then there's also the the management migration side of the equation, the non-economic side of the equation. So on the equity side, you know, part of it is doing that math, you know, thinking through, okay, what's the affordability? This firm's worth more each year. Then there's some of those standard building blocks like valuation and deal structure, you know, how are people going to pay? You want to start thinking through, okay, did I get into this industry to be a bank? Do I want to lend the next-gen money, or are there external solutions for that? The good news is there there are many of those these days. 
So starting through thinking through how you're going to migrate that ownership. I just want to start thinking through, you know, maybe key man insurance. If you got hit by a bus, um, having an insurance policy in place that can enable your heirs not only to be in good shape, but the next gen to better afford you. Um, and this can even get into incentive compensation as well as part of that plan as uh, part of the equation. On the management side, you know, clearly you want to start coaching those folks so that they have the right skill set. Uh, you want to think through, you know, migrating your client relationships or the management of the company, the operations of the company, um, even leadership. Leadership is a, is a skill that can be taught, and that also is different from the management side of the equation. So thinking through how you're going to migrate these responsibilities. Now, that's also different from suddenly having new shareholders, suddenly having new decision makers that, you know, may very well come with equity. So starting to think through the governance of this organization. When do shareholders have votes on, on certain questions and when do they not? What do those votes look like? Is it majority or one vote per owner? So thinking through that, that governance. Um, even thinking through partnership criteria. Moving beyond just, you know, Lisa is a partner or gee, Bob seems like he should be one. Instead methodically thinking through the, the partnership criteria, the eligibility, the process. All these things start to create not only a better succession plan, but a better managed organization. Each one of these elements is going to make your company a more industrial strength organization. So does it take work? Does it take time and energy? Absolutely. Do you need to do the entire laundry list that I, I ticked through over the last several minutes? You know, no, or at least no, not immediately. These are all components that, that can be assessed, and, and some will want to tackle two or three of these all at the beginning, or others will want to do the whole shooting match. But the good news is any advisor is in a position to think through what makes the most sense for them and then move forward appropriately. As a follow-on, and maybe it's something that could be extrapolated from what you've said, but if we can, let's maybe take a minute and um, point out one or two areas that in your experience and the work you've done with your firm You've seen consistently, I hate to use the, uh, the words done wrong, but let's say consistently missed in terms of mm -hmm. um, a succession planning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, two things come to mind. One is that, that equity side of the equation that we just we touched on a few minutes ago. It, it, you know, it's not uncommon to, to be at these uh, events. There's so many great events in this industry. You know, I'll have like a 10-minute break between uh, two speakers, and it's so common. I'll start the discussion. I'll be chit chatting with someone. They'll say, "Oh, you're the, you know, you're that M and A guy, the valuation guy, you know." And we'll start talking about what the the firm is worth. And oftentimes, this is a very large number. And you know, seven minutes later, I ask, uh, "So tell me about your succession plan." And they say, "Oh, well, I'm planning to sell internally. I, I'm going to sell to Lisa and Bob." And I'm doing math in my head, and I say it out loud. I'm like. How is this possible? <laughs> you know, six minutes ago you talked about your firm being worth these millions and millions of dollars, yet I, I can only assume these folks, unless they, they have a rich uncle, you know, are probably only making a couple hundred grand a year. This just is not going to connect. So I think for firms to go through that process, and, you know, briefly it's, it's it, hey, even gut check, what do you think your, your firm could be worth today? What do you think it's going to be worth a couple years down the road? Expla extrapolating in the future the increased value of this firm. And then starting to think through, okay, when am I going to be selling equity or my partners? And and starting to say, okay, maybe a couple of years from now I sell 10%. A couple of years after that I sell another 25%. And you can start, you know, thinking through when you're going to be selling shares, what that slug of shares is going to cost, and then what the next gen can potentially afford. So in many cases, you know, firms, I encourage, you know, anyone on the phone, if you have more than 200 million or so, start crunching this math. Um, and, and you can do it yourself, or you can hire firms like ours. We, we literally have a 10,000-cell a model to figure this out because it gets pretty complicated quickly. But I think that's one of the key blind spots, Greg, that, that really is, is a, a pain point for our industry, an exposure point for our industry, where because people haven't done this math, they don't realize that the window for them to sell it internally is closing pretty dramatically almost on a quarterly basis. So I think that's one big, profound blind spot. Um, you know, a second thing that we, we see often is um, 
incentive compensation that, that isn't done, quote, unquote, right. Um, we've been doing a lot of human capital and, in particular, in, the incentive compensation. And I think this is this is a legacy of the old days. You know, when, when advisors started in this industry, they, they got off the grid, quote, unquote, for lack of a better word, but it wasn't uncommon to pay their advisors based on, you know, certain basis points of assets under management. Well, well, this that they're overseeing, well, this creates destructive behavior, right? If you're if you're getting paid based on the amount of assets that you have, or gee, if you close new big business, we'll pay you thirty percent year one and twenty percent in year two, and then this this in the future or something. This is actually rewarding bad behavior. This rewards someone who who wants to keep every single client because they get paid more and more. Um, that's just not that's not optimal for a firm. You know, optimally, you want to have the ability as the owner, as the management team to say, hey, wait a sec, you know what? We should move some of your clients over to this junior person. We should make sure that you have enough time to bring in new business. You really want to think through methodically what that compensation structure should look like and, and craft something that's really not only aligned with their day-to-day activities and what they should be focused on. But ideally, this is the work we do, we tie it into the mission, the vision, the values of the company. We tie it back to the strategy and the business plans that they have. So that each time you're talking with a given employee about their incentive compensation plan, it's an opportunity to, you know, pull all these things together to help them to reinforce the vision, the mission, the values, the strategy of the organization. It's really a way to ensure that the, your people are not only not coin-operated, but they're working in a way that's going to best serve the clients, best serve the company, but also to enable them to make um, the best compensation that they can. So that's that's where we're doing a lot of work, and it's not uncommon to see um, some blind spots in that area. Perfect. Thank you. I think that's valuable information and probably a great way to wrap our conversation today. Um, Dave, I'd like to thank you very much for speaking with me today. I know our audience will learn a lot from this. Uh, this conversation leads me to think we probably should have you back for another interview soon. I feel like we could have gone on uh, much longer here today, and there's so many other things to talk about. Oh, I'd, love to, I'd love to do it. I think you're spot on. It's, it's such a great industry we're a part of, such a great community that we're a part of, and I think, um, you know, advisors are really trying to run better businesses. Um, and that, that's exactly what we do day in, day out, just helping these folks do that. So um, I'd, be, I'd be honored and pleased to, uh, to do another call like this. It would be a lot of fun. Perfect. Well, thank you, Dave, and I agree. It would be a lot of fun. If you'd like to receive more insightful tips about growing your business, sign up for Folio Institutional's blog at info.folioinstitutional.com forward slash blog. Neither Folio Institutional, its parent, Folio FN Incorporated, or any sister companies have a contractual relationship with DeVoe and Company. Folio has not compensated Dave DeVoe or DeVoe and Company in any way for this interview.